Hello, everyone. Welcome to Science in the Age of COVID-19. We are extremely happy to have you all with us today. Today, we are delighted to host Dr. Galit Altar, who is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and a group leader at the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard. Galit uses a combination of system serology tools and machine learning techniques to profile the diversity of antibodies in response to a range of infectious disease, namely HIV, Ebola, malaria, tuberculosis, and so on. And like many other labs, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Galit extended her expertise to SARS-CoV-2. She's specifically interested in the post-translational changes that modulate antibody functions. And today we are going to hear from Galit about how these changes, that is a post-translational modifications, impact the transfer of maternal SARS-CoV-2 antibodies via placenta. Galit, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to your talk. Thanks, Dorada. Okay, here we go. Um, let me just start sharing my screen and thank you for the invitation to be here with you today and the opportunity to discuss one of my favorite topics, which is um, transfer of immunity across the placenta to babies. So bear with me because normally when I get invited, I get asked to talk about vaccine induced immune responses in the general population or protective immunity in infected individuals in hospital settings. So it's been a while since I've gotten a chance to talk about this topic, but I'm really thrilled to give you all an idea of what we have learned in the past about the rules of placental transfer and how we adapted that to understand how this might change or be altered in the context of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the context of pregnancy. So where all the technology that we've developed in the lab really began was really in an effort about 15 years ago to develop tools to allow us to understand why some individuals, for reasons that are not totally clear to us, are able to raise protective immune responses against some of the most lethal pathogens that we have out there in nature. And the question really was is, well, what's different about the antibodies in those lucky individuals compared to all the individuals who do not resist or cannot control these other infectious diseases? And how can we learn from those protective immune responses that evolve in those lucky individuals so we can guide vaccine development or therapeutic design? We began by doing this in the context of HIV, as Serata mentioned, and we moved very rapidly to adapting the tool to malaria and flu and fungal infections, bacterial infections. And really hopefully what you're gonna get from this presentation is really the unbelievable flexibility of this platform technology, allowing us to interrogate the role of antibodies in antipathogen immunity against a very wide array of different uh, potential uh, diseases. And hopefully what you'll also um, get from this is the possibility of adapting this tool, not just for infectious pathogens, but also for other diseases of, protect, of particular interest where antibodies might play a protective or pathological role in the disease outcomes. Now, of course, because the tools were so flexible, we were able to very rapidly adapt our tools early on in 2020 to begin to look at SARS-CoV-2 humoral immune responses. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we rapidly adapted this tool and began to look for antibody correlates of natural immunity following SARS-CoV-2 infection in hospitalized populations, as well as have deployed that technology to understand how antibodies provide protection following vaccination. So what the tool essentially does and what we began to think about is, is really thinking about how we could profile antibodies at unprecedented depths. As vaccinologists, we believe that antibodies that are able to bind to our pathogen in just the right way and at just the right sites that they could prevent infection through a mechanism we call neutralization. We believe that these types of neutralizing antibodies are critically important for protection from infection, at least in the context of vaccination. That's what we're looking at on the left side. But what we've come to appreciate over the last 20 or 30 years is that antibodies do a whole lot more than just simply bind and block infection. And in fact, antibodies act really in a much more broad way to recruit the innate immune system, to recognize antibody opsonized targets, and then direct their biological activity to drive control and clearance of novel pathogens that come into the system. 
And these antibodies can direct a multiple uh, or multiple uh, different uh, effector functions, including the release of cytokines, phagocytosis. They can drive NK cell cytotoxicity. They can lead to degranulation from granulocytes. They can lead to complement deposition. They can even lead to antigen uptake into antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells that can then drive more effective T cell immune responses. And more recently, we've learned that antibodies can even get into the cells themselves and trigger intracellular FC receptors, including TRIM21, driving clearance of the pathogen without affecting the viability of the actual infected cell. So we became fascinated by all these different functions of antibodies, not just their ability to bind and block infection. And we began to think about how we could build tools that could effectively tell us in a completely agnostic and objective way whether there were different flavors of functions of antibodies that accumulated in people who were protected versus those who were not protected, and to use that information to really develop mechanistic hypotheses about how antibodies provide protection against our diseases of interest. Now, to begin to develop those tools, we began to think about how do antibodies drive these functions? What makes an antibody capable of driving these different activities? And what we came to appreciate from digging into the literature is that for many of our clinically approved vaccines that we deploy routinely across our populations, neutralization alone is really only key to protection from a small number of clinically approved vaccines. But a larger number of functions, including uh, cytotoxicity or opsonophagocytic clearance or complement deposition, are key to control or protection from other classes of vaccines that we have in our current clinical toolkit. And even more interestingly, we have a large array of additional vaccines where neutralization is not enough to explain protective immunity. We know that antibody functions are essential for that protective activity, but we still do not have assays that can tell us definitively it is through these alternative mechanisms of antibody action that confers protection from infection. So what this tells us is by looking at our clinical toolkit, we can see that other antibody functions beyond neutralization is key to protective immunity against many different pathogens that we are able to currently fight today through our vaccine uh, toolkit. So how do antibodies direct all these different functions? Well, if we just take IgG here as an example, you can essentially divide up an IgG molecule into two functional domains. On the top, we have the variable domains, the two arms that essentially stick us to the surface that we are interested in or that um, anybody is specific to. It's the domain that's involved in antigen recognition. It is a domain that binds and drives neutralization and of course targets material for opsonophagocytic elimination. Now the second domain down here is called the constant domain, but it is not constant at all. It also changes very rapidly during immune responses. And it's the constant domain that we became particularly interested in because it's the constant domain that links the innate and adaptive immune response to one another. It is the constant domain that provides instructions effectively to the innate immune system to drive all these different functions that I mentioned before, including phagocytosis, cytotoxicity, degranulation. They can even drive uh, uh, antigen uptake into antigen presenting cells, trap pathogens in mucus, can regulate epithelial barrier activity, regulates B cell survival, as well as allergic reactions. And so it's this domain here that we became incredibly fascinated by and began to think about how we naturally diversify this particular domain of antibodies to begin to think about how we could develop tools to truly interrogate how antibodies confer protection from infection. So we began to think about how we naturally tune the constant domain of an antibody. And if we just focus here on IgG as an example, during an immune response in humans, we can choose one of four different IgG subclasses um, to change the flavor of our humoral immune response. So we have IgG 1, 2, 3, and 4 that gives us four potential flavors of function. Each have the capacity to interact with the innate immune system in different ways and with different affinities. And so that gives us some variability in the immune response, but four flavors is not enough to explain all those other functions that I had mentioned before on the previous slides. 
So it turns out that we make a second modification to all of our antibodies. As Rita mentioned, we change glycosylation of a single um, glycan that is nestled between the two arms of the IgG molecule that's found here in the FC domain. This glycan is tucked inside the two arms. And in humans, we can choose up to 36 different glycan structures that we can attach to this region of the antibody with each arm having its own individual glycan. And what's fascinating about glycosylation of antibodies is that they change wildly during almost any inflammatory immune response. They change with age, cancer, infection, with autoimmune diseases, changes with, a, with um, uh, other types of inflammatory insults. And so this gave us clues that glycans were wildly um, altered during inflammatory immune responses. And that gives us 36 additional possible flavors by which antibodies can change in their constant domain that might give them the capacity to interact with innate immune receptors found on innate immune cells in different ways. But if we take the two changes together and we think that during an immune response, a B cell has the capability to either choose one of four different subclasses and one, and 30, one of 36 different sugars on each arm of the antibody, this essentially gives us 140 different possible combinations of antibodies that we can choose at a single B cell level to generate during an immune response to select potentially for different possible functions. And we believe that this combination of different subclasses and glycosylation is essentially like a barcode that individual B cells use to direct multiple different innate immune functions because each of these little barcodes allows for different interactions with FC receptors or complement found in the immune system. But the diversification of the humoral immune response gets even more interesting when we think about how the humoral immune response is deployed during an inflammatory disease. Because during an immune response to a pathogen or to a tumor or to a potential autoimmune disease, we never generate a single antibody or two antibodies that target that disease um, alone. What we do essentially during an inflammatory immune response is that we make billions, if not trillions of antibodies that all target this disease in different ways, targeting different antigens or epitopes in different ways with different kinetics following the initiation of that particular disease. And so if we think that every little antibody has a little mini barcode that a B cell can choose during the course of an immune response, and we think that we can theoretically make different combinations or swarms of antibodies that can form immune complexes that then collectively through mass action drive different kinds of immunological clearance. Then what that means is during an immune response, we can essentially generate much more sophisticated different flavors of these swarms of antibodies that collectively have much more complex barcodes because it's an arrangement of many, many, many individual barcodes that essentially lead to these very sophisticated uh, varying qualities of antibody swarm dynamics that drive immunological activity against our pathogen of interest. So this complexity in the humoral immune response is really what got us most excited over the last 15 years, thinking about how we could develop tools that could interrogate all the different changes that occur within the humoral immune response within a given individual to a pathogen of interest to basically be able to capture all that diversity through systems biology like tools, and then to use sophisticated machine learning approaches to essentially then be able to segregate what is the flavor of antibodies that accumulate in people who control diseases versus those individuals who are more susceptible or essentially cannot control our pathogen or infection of interest. And so this is really what gave birth to this technology we call system serology, which is essentially a array or of highly paralyzed assays that collectively interrogate the diversity of the humoral immune response to any pathogen of interest. So what we do in this platform technology is we capture the biophysical features of our pathogen specific antibodies in the top box or the functional characteristics of the antibodies in the bottom box. We initially adapted the tools to look at immune responses that develop in human populations, either following infection or vaccination. We rapidly adapted this tool to 
the interrogation of monoclonal antibody responses or monoclonal antibody therapeutics and how they interact with the immune system. And over the last few years, you've adapted these tools to look at humoral immune response diversification, also in the context of animal models that are routinely used to study diseases um, caused by different infectious diseases. What we do is we collect plasma or serum or any fluid for that matter from these different populations of interest. And then we subject those plasma samples or fluid samples to these two different platforms. On the biophysical side, we capture what is the overall level of different antibody isotypes or subclasses of antibodies to um, individual antigens from a pathogen um, of interest or different variants of those antigens or individual epitopes from those pathogens of interest. Here with the capability of essentially testing 500 different antigens simultaneously at the same time. We also purify the antigen-specific antibodies and ask if they bind to different FC receptors with different affinities. These are the innate immune receptors that are found on innate immune cells that trigger the um, functional activity that is leveraged by antibody, uh, antibodies themselves. We can also purify the antigen-specific antibodies and also ask how are they glycosylated in different ways because we know that the sugar is so critical for tuning the affinity of antibodies to different FC receptors. Now, at a functional level, what we do is we ask whether the pathogen-specific antibodies can fix complement, activate neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, and K-cells, eosinophils, and dritic cells, if they trap antigen into um, germinal centers, if they can activate or interact with non-immune cells like epithelial or endothelial cells. We can ask if they activate adaptive uh, immune cells, as well as we can ask whether or not the antibodies cause enhancement, if they drive apoptosis, or if they change immune complex structure dynamics. And we capture all this individual data, capturing anywhere from one to 500 different data points from each of these assays. And then we integrate all this information in typical um, types of uh, data sets or databases, and then apply machine learning tools to look for patterns in the antibody profiles that might distinguish individuals who control or don't control the disease. And just to give you an example over here, what I'm showing you is a giant heat map showing the influenza specific immune response found in 120 different individuals, where every row here represents a different person that we profiled, and every column represents a different data type that we captured from these flu specific responses. And the only point that I want to make with this data is just to make the point that there are no two individuals that are identical. Everyone has their own flu specific antibody footprint or fingerprint. Everyone responds to flu in different ways, depending on when they were immunized, when they were last infected, what sequence of viruses they may have seen in their lives, probably by what vaccines they've had and what order over the course of their entire lifetime, probably by their microbiome, as well as many other environmental factors that could shape the quality of their humoral immune response. But hopefully what you can begin to see at least by eye is that there are clearly different groups forming where there's a group over here on the top where in the right they are hotter for these flu specific profile elements compared to individuals down here that are colder or more blue in their response to these particular data elements. And so this already begins to show us that there are patterns in the data and there are different groups of individuals. And that grouping begins to give us information about what makes populations different, particularly when we have an outcome of interest that we're trying to study. So I wanna give you an example of how we use this technology and specifically to study a very strange question uh, for all those individuals who are always looking for correlates of immunity against individual pathogens. Here, what we set out to do is to try to apply this tool, not to necessarily tell us why is, are some people protected versus other people not protected, but more interestingly to tell us whether or not we can begin to develop the rules or understand how the placenta chooses what antibodies it selects from the mother to give to the child. So we thought by using these deep dive, comprehensive antibody profiling tools, we could begin to ask the question of what's different about the antibodies in the mom versus the antibodies in the baby to begin to truly understand how the placenta works. So where we began uh, a couple of years ago was really with these um, papers that have been published back in the 1960s that essentially has established the dogma of how the placenta selects antibodies to confer to, to their babies. And the dogma essentially stated that the placenta prefers to transfer IgG antibodies to the babies. It does not transfer IgMs or IgAs to uh, neonates. And that there was an interesting hierarchy of which 
quality, which qualities of antibodies the placenta would choose with respect to subclasses of antibodies where the placenta seems to like to transfer IgG1s and IgG3s more than it liked to transfer IgG4s and IgG2s. And the dogma that arise from this particular study and from um, this particular array of um, uh, uh, experiments that had been conducted in the 1960s was that the, essentially that the level of antibody in maternal serum was directly correlated to the level of antibody in the cord. So if a mother had lots of antibodies, then the cord or the baby would receive lots of antibodies. And this was the correlation that was published in this nature paper in 1966 to really show how highly correlated mother uh, serum was to baby serum antibody titers. And honestly, when I look at this data set, I really don't understand how they drew this line through this uh, particular um, graph because it doesn't look all that correlated to me. And in fact, there were some mothers that have very high levels of antibodies um, in their uh, serum that do not transfer very well to infants. And then there were some infants that have very high levels of antibodies in their serum or in the cord um, that whose mothers did not have very high titers of antibodies either. And so what this began to tell us is that there might be some different selectivity. And so the question was, is well, how is the placenta choosing the antibodies that are going over? And could system serology begin to help us understand this? So a little while after these 1966 papers, um, an, a new dogma had emerged that there was a specific FC receptor called the neonatal FC receptor or FCRN that is expressed highly on um, the syncytial trophoblast um, in the placenta. And the FCRN was selectively positioned in these um, unique endothelial cells to capture antibodies from the mother on the left side over here, capture them in these particular endo endocytic compartments, and then transfer them over to the fetus, fetus. And so FCRN, which binds here at the bottom of the IgG molecule, was considered the massive or major vehicle that selected IgG1 preferentially over other antibody subclasses and gave them over to the fetus. And that became the dogma of how, um, antibody, how antibody transfer occurred. Now, the important thing to remember about this dogma is that FCRN indiscriminately binds to any IgG. So every IgG mo molecule, if FCRN is the only mechanism of selection and transfer, essentially every IgG molecule should go over at equivalent levels from the mom to the infant because there's no selectivity on the antibodies beyond binding to this bottom part of the antibody, which is theoretically does not, is not influenced by the antigen specificity uh, in, um, on the antibody on the top domain of the, um, of the molecule. But a study came out not long afterwards in the 1990s that began to challenge this hypothesis. And what I'm showing you here are the levels of antibody transfer in an otherwise healthy uh, baby population. And what this particular study looked at was the level of antibodies that were, tra uh, that were transferred in full-term babies on the right side or premature babies on the left side. And the only point that I want to make with this particular analysis is that they compared antibody transfer to measles, Coxsackie virus, enterovirus, and multiple polymyelitis viruses. And what they found was really quite unusual, and that was if we just focus here on the full-term babies, there were wildly different levels of transfer occurring from the mother to the infant across all of these different viruses. Whereas we would assume that if FCRN is acting alone, you would expect that every antibody would be transferred at a ratio of one or above because there is an equal selection of antibodies going across from the mother to the infant. But that's not what we saw in this particular study. And in fact, some antibodies are transferred preferentially to the baby. Other antibodies are transferred very poorly to the baby, suggesting that there is additional level of selectivity across the placenta. And the question was, is how are we choosing which IgG ones we give to our infants? So this is where we began to think, well, why don't we apply our system serology tool to look at the antibodies on the mother side, look at the antibodies on the cord side at really this unbelievable depth and begin to truly understand what it was that the placenta was choosing to begin to dissect out and understand mechanistically how the placenta was making these decisions. So the first thing I'm going to show you is just some of the examples of the functions that we captured across the placenta. And what we focused on here for this particular analysis were antibody specific responses to pertussis. 
So the pertussis vaccine is given during pregnancy to most pregnant women. And the pertussis vaccine um, is composed of four different antigens, FHA, PTN, FIM, and PTX. The antigens don't really matter, but the point is that we can use them to capture pertussis specific antibodies from the plasma of the mother, when it's M, or the cord in C, and we can compare the levels across the different um, compartments of antibodies. Um, and here we were looking at the ability of these antigen specific antibodies to recruit monocytes to drive phagocytosis or antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis. So the point I wanna make here is if we look across the different antigen specificities, what we found was that it was interesting that phagocytic functions were in some instances not transferred very well over to the infant. In some instances were flat and transferred pretty well over to the infant. And for others, again, here they're going down, but it's not that there was any selective enhanced transfer of these pertussis specific antibodies that are able to drive monocyte phagocytosis from the mother to the child. And rather, it was rather erratic across the different specificities. So the placenta was somehow not really choosing this in a directed way. So we looked at another antibody function, looking at the ability of the transferred antibodies to recruit a different function that's neutrophil phagocytosis. And here what we found was a different pattern. Interestingly here, for some antigens, we saw a very good transfer, but interestingly, again, flat from the mother to the child. For PTN, it was rather erratic. And for these two different antigens, FIM and PTX, we saw some directed transfer where PTX, as an example, these antigen-specific antibodies were definitely being transferred actively over to the mother, suggesting that there was some selectivity here, at least for some antigen-specific populations, but it didn't look to us like the ability to drive monocyte phagocytosis or neutrophil phagocytosis was a common signature on the back end of the antibodies that was leading to this directed transfer over to infants. So this is where we got to thinking, well, is there any other function that is being deliberately transferred to infants? So we looked at a third function. We looked at the ability of antibodies to drive NK cell activation. So what I'm showing you here now are three different readouts of the ability of antibodies to drive NK activation. On the left side, we're looking at the ability of antibodies to drive NK cell degranulation, interferon gamma secretion, so cytokine secretion, or chemokine secretion, MIP1 beta secretion by antibodies on NK cells. And hopefully what is evident to you right away is that the placenta is selectively choosing antigen specific antibodies that are able to drive very high levels of NK cell activation, irrespective of which function we looked at. So there was a deliberate effort on the side of the placenta to pick these antibodies and these antibodies were selectively being transferred. So the placenta was making a decision and was making a decision based on a function. So the question was, is how is the placenta doing this? What is that selectivity and how, is the, uh, how are these antibodies uh, chosen? So we began to look at different biophysical features of the antibodies. So first let's take a look at the differences in IgG subclasses that are selected by the placenta. Here, just looking at total IgG titers across these four pertussis antigens, we could see very clearly that there was um, active transfer of IgG levels over to the infant. This is not a passive process. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but in fact, the placenta is selectively pulling as many of these antibodies as possible out of the infant uh, or out of the mother to bring into the infant. And this is done really at a total IgG level. If you look at which individual IgG subclasses were selectively transferred, very much like that 1966 papers, we saw that IgG1 here in the dark purple were selectively being transferred across all antigen specificities over to the infant with variable but lower levels of transfer of IgG2, 3s, and 4s, exactly what we had seen in that original study. So the placenta likes IgG1. This is likely driven by the fact that FCRN, the neonatal receptor, does bind to IgG1 more effectively, but that didn't explain why there were different levels of individual antigen specificities or functions that were going across. So we asked the question, could there be another change in the antibody that the placenta really was making that helped these antibodies get over selectively? So we took all the data we had collected from the mothers in the dark purple and the infants in the pink, and we asked, well, what are the features of the antibodies that are most different across these two compartments? And does that tell us what the placenta is selecting? So what you can see here is that if you do a multivariate analysis, taking all these data, there's really no overlap 
between the antibodies that go into the cord versus those that exist in the antibody, at least with respect to their FC qualities. What the mother is selecting is shown here on the pink, what is enriched in the, in the, sorry, in the infants, and what is retained in the mothers is shown in the purple or the dark color. And what you can see here, at least in the top variables that are selectively being transferred to the infants, it's all of these NK cell functions, total IgG1 levels, we see that's directed over, particular functions, neutrophil phago and complement phagocytosis as well. But interestingly, the next two features were all glycan signatures. So glycans were somehow part of the signature. So there was potentially a role for variation in glycosylation of the FC domain that was playing a part in this transfer over to the mother. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we can choose up to 32 different glycans on the back end of our antibodies. And the way that we choose these different glycan structures, the way we generate them is by varying the amount of fucose down here in the red Gluknac, or, or sorry, galactose in the yellow over here um, in the circle, or sialic acid that we can add to the antibody, as well as this bisecting gluknac that we add between the arms. So we change these four little sugars and we add them in different combinations to our antibodies. And this variation of these four sugars is really what creates this differential glycosylation pattern on the back end of our antibodies. So we began to look at whether or not these particular qualities of antibodies were in some way changing in a maternal transfer across the barrier. So what I'm showing you here is a transfer ratio of these individual glycan structures. So here looking at if the antibody had no galactose, so G0, if it had one galactose, G1, if it had two galactoses as G2, or had any galactose as a total G, so in addition of this G1 and G2, if the antibody had fucose down here, if the antibody had a bisecting gluknac over here, if it had a sialation on the very top. And hopefully what you can see is very clear signatures of transfer across the maternal fetal barrier, where the mothers down here are retaining all of these agalactosylated structures, so structures that did not have any of these yellow circles. They were transferring over these more highly galactosylated structures, so the ones that had this uh, structure over to the infant. And interestingly, also seem to like to transfer sialated structures and maybe some bisected structures more effectively over to the infant compared to the mother. And this was not only true on the bulk antibody glycan profiles that we saw from the mother to the child, but this was also true for transfer ratios if we looked at individual antigen specific populations where we could see for this particular pertussis antibody population that there was a clear restriction of transfer of particular glycosylated profiles. So they retain these agalactosylated structures and transferred over these particular structures much more effectively. So what this told us is that beyond IgG1, the placenta was making decisions based on what sugars were attached on the back end of the antibody. And to prove to ourselves that these glycans were influencing FC receptor binding, we made monoclonal antibodies that either had this a uh, very short structure that was associated with poor, poor transfer or made very long uh, structures that were highly associated with transfer across the placenta um, across both of these antibody populations. And what we found was that these particular structures, the short or the long, didn't seem to affect general FC receptor binding here, short and long across the uh, high affinity FC gamma R1 or the two phagocytic FCRs. But what we did begin to see was that these particular structures, especially the long structure that transfers very well over the placenta, did bind very well to FC gamma R3, which is essential for driving NK cell activation, as well as F the neonatal FC receptor that we know is critical for transfer of antibodies across the fetal uh, barrier. And so what this told us was that there was a role for glycosylation potentially in selecting antibodies that go over. And these selected antibodies were also able to arm the neonate with antibodies that are able to recruit NK cells very efficiently. To prove to ourselves that this was really the mechanism of placental transfer, we also stained the placental syncytial trophoblasts for different receptors. Here looking at the high affinity FC receptor, we saw very little staining on the syncytial trophoblast um, here in this stain here, no red. Um, but when we looked at other FC receptors like the FC gamma R2 or FC gamma R3 receptor, we want the one that we believe is critical for helping to transfer antibodies over. Hopefully if you just toggle over here on the right side, you can see over here that there's really nice overlap in the blue and the green all along the syncytial trophoblast, demonstrating that at least for this FC receptor, 
not so much for this FC receptor, there was overlap between the neonatal receptor and FC gamma R3 staining. So what this told us for the first time in this study in healthy individuals is that mothers make lots of different antibodies to different pathogens following vaccination and infection. And it's not just FCRN that's transferring these antibodies over to baby, but instead what is happening is that mothers are somehow able to select for particular antibodies of the highest functional quality from the mother's blood by utilizing both FCRN and FC gamma R3 to choose particular qualities of antibodies that they flip over to the neonate, empowering the neonate with highly NK cell activating antibodies on the first day of life. So this was really exciting to learn that this was being tuned naturally during um, pregnancy. But the question that we asked ourselves at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is, well, what's happening during infection? Is something changing uh, in the context of infection? So during natural pregnancy in the absence of infection, we learned that there is a selective transfer, but during infection, what ends up happening is that women start making different antibodies. And the question was whether or not these different antibodies that occur during infection might change what happens and what is transferred over to the baby. This became really important to us during the pandemic because pregnant women had higher levels of hospitalization and they were excluded from the vaccine trials. And what was really important to remember was that during infections, during pregnancy, we know that there is poor antibody transfer. We've learned that from malaria, HIV, and other diseases. So the question was really or not, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection was altering antibody transfer across the placenta. And if that would have important ramifications for how we decide to uh, um, administer vaccines during pregnancy. So what we did is we studied 34 women um, that were healthy and that did not have SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we looked at antibodies in their blood and in the cord in this group of individuals. And we compared this to 22 women um, for whom we had matched cord and uh, maternal blood um, that were acutely infected with SARS-CoV-2. And we began to profile the humoral immune responses across these two populations. And so I just want to show you the response, the transfer of flu-specific antibodies to hemagglutinin or to pertussis antigen PTN across the mother-child pairs. This is the healthy women in the yellow or the SARS-CoV-2 infected women in the pink. And hopefully what you can see here is pretty equivalent transfer from mother to child for flu-specific antibodies and pertussis-specific antibodies irrespective of COVID infection. So that was really important. The placenta seemed to be intact and there was good transfer of the um, H, the flu-specific antibodies and the pertussis-specific antibodies in these mothers. But what was striking, what was unexpected, was that while there was this selective transfer of these non-SARS-CoV-2 antigens during uh, um, infection in the uh, placenta in pregnancy, there was less transfer for SARS-CoV-2 antigens, where here we saw lower levels of transfer for most of the SARS-CoV-2 antigens, including the receptor binding domain specific antibodies, spike specific antibodies and nucleic capsid specific antibodies. And the point that I wanna make here, and it's really important to recognize, is that usually these antibodies, the placenta is choosing to give more antibody to the baby, as we see here for flu and pertussis. Here we saw flat or less transfer in these particular mothers, suggesting that there was something going on in these mothers that was leading to less transfer of antibodies to babies. Now, we didn't only look at the overall levels of antibodies, but whether they had good functions. And here, looking at the flu-specific response for monocyte phagocytosis, NK cell activation, neutrophil phagocytosis, or complement activating antibodies, you can see here that for the flu-specific response, the mothers always transferred more of these antibodies over to their infants. So there was this active transfer of flu-specific antibodies that had lots of functions to infants in our cohort. But when we looked at the SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody functions, for some of these functions, you could see it's really going down negatively for these particular antigen specificities, including to the spike and the nucleocapsid, um, as well as for the RBD, where we saw lower levels of complement transfer and no transfer at all of RBD specific uh, and cell activating antibodies, really poor transfer completely over the infants, suggesting that there was not only a total flat line of what was being transferred or lower levels, but certain functions were being excluded from transfer over to neonates. 
So the question was, is, well, what's SARS-CoV-2 doing? Because the flu-specific antibodies are going over, but the, SAR, but the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are not going over. So what is going on? Because the placenta seems to be working fine for some antibodies, just not for those targeting SARS-CoV-2. So he began to ask, is it just a total amount of time from the time of infection that was altering what was transferred over? We didn't think it was because this is an active process. So there should be no real time denominator that would matter for transfer over the placenta. So we began to think, well, maybe it's something about alterations in glycosylation of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that's driving this defect. So we began to look at glycosylation changes in COVID positive moms in the bulk antibodies in their blood. And what you can see here is that there really were specific changes happening over in the cord um, across the different uh, uh, mother-child pairs. But interestingly, these patterns of change were relatively consistent across the um, COVID negative and the COVID positive moms. But the bulk antibodies in the infants were different than those in their moms, and that was expected. The question was, is if the bulk transfer was somehow still conserved, even though it's altered in the babies, as we would expect, because the placenta is selecting for particular sugars on the back end of antibodies that are being transferred over, what was different about the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies? So we purified the spike-specific antibodies here in the purple and compared them to the glycans on the bulk antibodies in these infants. And hopefully what you can see here is that there were significant perturbations in the kinds of sugars that were present on the back end of the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the pregnant women. What we saw was that there was elevated levels of this particular sugar called fucose, elevated levels of galactosylation of the spike-specific antibodies, and lower levels of other sugars like the bisecting glucnac. So there were changes specifically in the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that were distinct from those that were present in the bulk antibodies that we knew were being transferred in a normal way based on the placenta, um, uh, based on HA and pertussis-specific antibodies. So the question is, is, well, what was being selectively transferred in the spike-specific antibody fraction of antibodies compared to the bulk antibodies, either in COVID-negative moms in the yellow or COVID-positive moms in the pink? And hopefully what you can see just by looking at this purple line is that there were specific sugars that were transferring over to infants more effectively in the um, spike-specific response compared to the non-spike-specific response in either the COVID-negative or COVID-positive mums, where there was a selective transfer, interestingly, of agalactosylated antibodies, which was different than what we see in the bulk population. There was a selective transfer of these bisecting and silylated structures and lower levels of transfer of these fucosylated structures in this particular uh, setting of SARS-CoV-2 antibody transfer. So to get, to get a real uh, specific idea of what was being transferred from the mother to the child, again, we took all the data and we asked, well, what is the cord selecting here in the dark pink versus the light pink? And can that help inform what is being selected by the placenta for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies? And if you look here at the features that are either enriched in the mom or enriched in the baby, the one thing that struck us is that glycan differences were among the top features. And interestingly, both of these structures lacked galactose, they were G0, but the ones that were retained in the mom had fucose and the ones that went over to the baby did not have fucose. Now fucose is essential because fucose controls ADCC activity or NK cell activation. Here, if we look at the level of fucose on these individual antibody glycan fractions with low galactose high, and higher levels of galactose, what you can see here is that the spike-specific antibodies that are agalactosylated are selectively lack fucose. They are lower than one, whereas those that have galactose have very high levels of fucose. So somehow what it looked like was that the placenta was choosing to give these afucosylated species over to the child. And the reason for that was most likely because these types of antibodies are better at binding to FC receptor, receptors, including the neonatal receptor and FC receptors that were found um, uh, uh, um, in that original study, namely FC gamma R3A. And so what we know is that lack of fucose from this particular experiment is highly associated with binding to this FC gamma R3A receptor compared to um, antibody glycan profiles that include fucose. So we believe that this change 
that occurs in SARS-CoV-2 infection is really what changes the quality of the antibodies that are being transferred over to the infant. Now, again, we looked in SARS-CoV-2 infected moms, COVID positive moms, and we looked at whether they expressed these different FC receptors, a neonatal receptor, an FC gamma R3A, and we found was very high levels of expression of both these FC receptors, both in the COVID negative moms, maybe a little higher in the COVID positive moms. But what was most interesting about the level of the neonatal receptor across the negative moms and the positive moms, or the FC gamma R3 receptor across these two groups, COVID positive moms increased FC gamma R3A in the placenta, so capturing these acuclosylated antibodies. And more interestingly, these receptors co-localize extremely efficiently in the context of infection. So the infected placenta augments the co-localization of these receptors to selectively capture these antibodies that are popping up during infection. So the moral of the story that we learned was that during normal infection or during normal gestation, moms produce lots of antibodies, but the placenta selectively chooses antibodies that are able to bind to the neonatal receptor that happen to have particular glycan profiles that empower the baby with enhanced NK cell activating antibodies. During SARS-CoV-2 infection, the antibodies change, particularly the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are produced with different glycan profiles. And the placenta also changes during infection, augmenting the role of other FC receptors, including FC gamma R3A, in its ability to capture antibodies with the neonatal receptor to help select for even better antibodies to transfer over to the infant. So even if there are lower levels of antibodies going over to the infant, the ones that are being selected have the capacity to recruit these NK cell functions more effectively so the neonate can be empowered to drive enhanced protection if they come in contact with the virus in the first days of life. Now, I wanna go quickly just to add one last tidbit that this sieving is not only happening at the level of the placenta, but work that we've been doing recently looking at breast milk, looking at what antibodies are present in the mother's plasma versus what is present in the milk has also shown us that there is incredible selectivity of which antibodies are transferring over in um, the mother's milk. So here looking at the plasma on top, seeing high levels of IgG1 transfer um, in uh, or presence in the plasma in COVID positive moms versus COVID negative moms. Also high levels in the breast milk in COVID positive moms versus COVID negative moms. But interestingly, if you look at which functions or qualities of antibodies are transferred from the milk to the serum, we can see here that IgG1 is not transferred very well across the barrier. But for example, IgA we know is transferred well, so are IgMs. But then binding to particular FC receptors is highly selective with antibodies transferring over the combined to particular FC receptors. So there's selectivity also across the uh, mammary barriers. So what I wanna leave you with is this idea that the placenta is selective and it's choosing antibodies based on FC glycosylation. This FC glycosylation changes with SARS-CoV-2 infection, and this plays an important role in changing the quality of the antibodies that are transferred over the placenta to infants. But the placenta still enriches, irrespective of infection, antibodies based on sugars to empower babies with antibodies that are able to recruit innate immune function to kill pathogens should they come in contact with them in the first days of life. And this really provides us with incredibly important implications, thinking about when we should vaccinate women during pregnancy, where we believe that, uh, that, that theoretically from dogma that the third trimester of pregnancy is the time we wanna give the most vaccines to our pregnant women because we have big placentas that can transfer anybody as well. But what this taught us is that potentially vaccinating the third trimester might lead to production of antibodies that are not uh, ideal for transfer and then maybe we should wait and study pregnancy a little bit more carefully to decide when we should transfer, when we should administer vaccines to get the highest level of antibodies over to our babies as possible. So with that, I wanna thank the people who did this work. This work was really done by an incredibly talented PhD student in the lab, Caroline Adio, and an incredible collaboration with uh, uh, OBGYN um, here at Mass General, Andrea Edlow. I wanna thank all the folks involved in this work as well as our funders, and I thank you for your attention. Wow, Glee, that was amazing. Um, I've had to reevaluate um, my assumptions about a lot of antibody effector function. Um, so uh, yeah, people, so type your questions um, into the Q&A box and um, it also helps if you raise your hand.
makes it easier for us to uh, call on you. Um, let, uh, okay, so uh, while I want to ask one question before we move to the audience uh, questions. So, I mean, dogma has been that FCRN is mediating transcytosis of the antibody. Is, is, is that still true? Or do you think it's mediated by maybe FCR uh, gamma R3 or? Um... Yeah, so, so I think that the, there's no question that FCRN plays a role in this transcytosis or transfer of antibodies from the mother to the child. But I think that what we're learning is that there are other molecules that are present on the placenta that also have a role in this process. And maybe if I can just go up to this particular slide, because I think this shows this, illustrates this barrier the best here, is that there's actually two barriers, right? And there's even mm -hmm. space in between the barriers. So on the top barrier here, you have the dogma, right? Where you had the neonatal receptor that captured antibodies and then selectively kept the IgG ones and gave them over to the other side. And then these antibodies still have to make it from this side over to this side, going through this kind of empty space that's filled with these macrophage-like cells called Hofbauer cells that also have FC receptors on them and then get across the fetal endothelium. You know, it, it's, it's pretty hard to imagine there's not more selection going on at this level of the placenta because there are lots of places where antibodies can still come in contact with other FC binding potential receptors. What we began to learn though, is that this um, syncytial trophoblast layer has multiple other FC receptors. And we believe they also have multiple C-type lectin-like receptors that are also interacting with these differentially glycosylated antibodies. And that what might actually be happening is that, you know, these types of receptors like these FC gamma R3s and C-type lectins are potentially expressed on the surface Mm. And they do this initial capture, mm. and then they come into these endoso endosomal compartments where they now interact with FCRN, and now FCRN does a second level of selection, mm. and now they're transferred over where, again, there is additional selection happening by these other types of innate immune receptors. So these barriers are doing much more selection than we had originally anticipated and inflammation and disease during pregnancy is changing these receptors yeah. while we're also changing the sugars in the back end of the antibodies. So yeah. the selection is much, much, much more complex than we had originally you know, kind of accepted back in the 1960s. Yeah, and so you think these lectins might rise to the status of co-receptors for crossing or? Well, we, I mean, we know that there are many C-type lectins that are involved in interacting with antibodies in other immune um, uh, diseases, right? We know DC sign from Jeff Ravitch seems to be critical for binding silated FCs. Um, we know that there are other um, uh, dectin-like receptors that can interact with immune complexes in some situations from work from Falk Nimrion. So I would think that there is no question that there's gonna be other lectin-like receptors that are involved in this process. I think that it was just a simplified model that helped us understand why IgG1 got over selectively, but it didn't help us understand now which subpopulations of antibodies of IgG1 are going across. And I just wanna make the point that this is important because this is selection, not just of pathogen specific antibodies, mm. but this is regulating the transit of commensal specific antibodies, allergen specific antibodies, as well as autoantibodies yeah, that are nice. somehow getting selective permission Mm -hmm. cross over during gestation. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, I have many more questions, but um, the audience does too. So, uh, Caitlin, um, please All right. I think, uh, um, unmute yourself and ask your two questions, please. I think Kaylin wants us to ask the questions. So oh. I'll read her question. So Kaylin has a general question about maternal transfer. Uh, so she wants to know if somebody is deficient in one particular IgG subtype, right? Does it mean that there was an issue with transfer of this particular subtype, um, uh, the issue with maternal transfer of this particular subtype? So if it doesn't transfer, is the mother not making it? Is that the question? I'm not sure. Well, if if somebody is deficient in an antibody subtype, is it because they did not receive it via placenta from their mothers? Um, so I'm not sure that we see 
um, avert deficiencies in sub classes of antibodies, if that's Caitlin's question. I mean, we see that many transfer over. There is just selectivity for particular subclasses of antibodies and particular uh, glycosylation profiles of the antibodies. What um, it does happen is when we see that there are particular um, glycan profiles that are not getting over, it could be either that the mother didn't make them or that that placenta during that, you know, in that mother, that placenta did not have the combination of FC receptors potentially um, that were essential for selecting those and transferring them over to the infant is most likely what's happening. If a mom is lacking a particular isotype, that doesn't really affect the placenta, right? Because the, um, the placenta only chooses IgG, but if the mother is agamma globulinemic, which might be what she's trying to get at, um, then of course there are very low or no levels of IgGs in the mom. And then the babies are more vulnerable to disease. And there are, um, you know, uh, it's there, the children from agamma globulinemic moms are followed very closely to make sure that they are fine um, and that they do are able to mount their own responses. And so that is a particular peculiar situation um, in which those children are sometimes supplemented with IVIG um, or followed more closely for particular infections. Hmm. Interesting. So while, thank you. So while we are um, at antibodies, so the, the, the transfer ratio data that you showed us, uh, the HA and pertussis antibody transfer versus the SARS-CoV-2 transfer ratios and the transfer properties. So if I understand correct, the, the HA and the pertussis vaccine were, sorry, uh, antibodies were in response to vaccine, whereas the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies were in response to natural infection, right? So how much of this difference do you think is due to vaccine-induced antibody versus antibodies in response to natural infection? Because That's as you are in the middle of a vaccine rollout, do you expect, uh, I mean, how, what, what do we expect about vac you know, vaccinating pregnant women? That's such an important question. Okay, so that's a great question. So, so it's important, right? Flu vaccines, flu responses are not only due to vaccination, right? We do get, we do induce them on an annual basis through vaccination, but you know, we see flu all of our lives also through infection. So they're modified and modulated both by vaccines and infection. For testis, also there's exposure environmentally, um, but of course the majority of the responses we're seeing here are most likely vaccine induced um, because there are lower levels of exposure to pertussis in our general population, at least here in New England. Um, that being said, um, what I think is really important is that you know we do know that vaccine-induced immune responses can have different glycan profiles than infection-associated immune responses, but the one commonality across both vaccine-induced immune responses and infection-induced immune responses is that following proximal to the time of either vaccination or infection, all the antibodies that are produced are inflamed, right? This is a natural immune response. When we first start making antibodies following vaccination infection, they have these eat me signals on the back end. So they are, they have short glycans that are more agalactosylated because what we're trying to do is proximal to that initial exposure to a particular novel antigen. We want to make antibodies that will clear infection as fast as possible from the immune system. So whether you're inducing antibodies through vaccination or through infection, those early antibody qualities are very, very similar. And so what we worry about and what we're seeing in our vaccinated pregnant women here in Boston is that their vaccine COVE-2 specific responses are also looking very similar to those that we see in women who had COVID-19. So they have the same inflammatory profile that does not seem to be the optimal type of antibody that the placenta likes to give to babies. Now, why the placenta tends to exclude those more inflamed antibody profiles is probably because the placenta wants to protect the neonate. The last thing the placenta wants to do is to transfer over inflammatory antibodies to the baby that will then cause a massive cytokine storm in a neonate if they should come in contact with a pathogen on the first day of life. Like that would be a disaster. You have an immature immune system, an improperly, or let's say more anergic innate immune effector cell landscape. And now you give them these super inflammatory antibodies that will essentially drive pathology in the infant. Mm 
Mm. So what that means is that most likely these inflammatory antibodies are being selectively retained in the mom and not given to the baby to protect the baby. But that's all the mom has close to the time of, you know, delivery if she has been recently infected or recently vaccinated. So what we're beginning to see now, though, is that if you look at moms who were infected with COVID-19 in the first or second trimester, or they were vaccinated in the first and second trimester, they do transfer way more antibody to their infants. And the quality of those antibodies is superior. And it's not just the time from exposure to the antigen that is dictating how much antibody is getting over to the infant, but it's because they have resolved the inflammatory response to the infection or following vaccination. They now have a resting profile on their antibodies that the uh -huh. placenta really likes and wants to transfer over to the baby to drive life or, or longer lived, you know, less inflammatory protection against a pathogen should the baby come in contact with it. Great. The mom selects the best for the baby. All right. Uh, here's a follow-up question from which I got via email. So uh, this is from Jonathan Marvin. So as a follow-up question, Johnny wants to know about the different types of vaccine because mRNA vaccines are quite new and they're different from the pertussis and flu vaccines used. So what do we expect? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So right now we only have EUA approval to look at mRNA vaccines um, that are being rolled out now. Um, to healthcare workers that are pregnant. So we've had a chance to look in um, those healthcare workers that have accepted the EUA approved vaccines, right? Because there's no recommendation to give vaccination to pregnant women in the general population. So it's only these women that we can study. Um, and we don't yet have any vaccine studies with the other products, right, in pregnant women. So what I can tell you is really fascinating. It's exactly what I just mentioned before, is that these mRNA vaccines, just like viral infections, driving these very potent inflammatory antibodies in the pregnant women. So they respond incredibly well to the vaccine and they're doing a great job of making antibodies. It's just that if that vaccine is administered too close to the time of delivery, not enough antibody is transferring over to the infant. And that's the, for the same reasons as what we see with infection is that they're generated with this inflammatory back end that makes them less desirable to the placenta for transfer. But we believe now that we're starting to see some of the first second trimester women getting vaccinated and some of the first trimester women getting vaccinated, we're gonna follow them. And we're gonna see if those antibodies are gonna transfer better over to the, to the infants. Um, and we do hope that that's exactly what's gonna end up happening. But what we do see is that these mRNA vaccines are unbelievably potent inducers of antibodies um, and maybe even more potent than we see with traditional flu vaccines and pertussis vaccines, right? That are not very well adjuvanted and don't have the same um, you know, level of uh, immunogenicity that we see with these mRNA vaccines. So I, I think the answer to Johnny's question is that we'll know soon if other platforms are better or worse at inducing this type of immunity, and maybe even will induce lower inflammatory antibodies that might get over better. So who knows, maybe other platforms will do better in maternal or in pregnant women, but we don't know the answer to that yet because they're not approved. Great, uh, thank you, Galit. We now have a great question from Nan uh, on, Nan, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Uh, what do we know about antibodies in the breast milk in the nursing moms if they get vaccinated after the baby is born? After the baby is born. So that we don't have a lot of samples for. We have um, quite a few moms who were vaccinated during pregnancy, and now we can see their, the antibodies in their breast milk. Um, but you have to remember, Nan, that um, the vaccines were only approved in um, January, right? It's December and January. So we don't have a ton of um, breastfeeding moms that have been um, profiled. We do have now, we started recruiting both, uh, you know, post-birth as well as we have many pre-birth uh, uh, mom samples for breast milk um, that we're going to start to profile. But I can't tell you what happens after uh you know, they've given birth and then gotten vaccinated and then the breast milk. But um, what is really kind of cool is that the breast milk is transferring um, lots of antibodies uh, to SARS-CoV-2. They are not just IgAs, which is kind of the dogma that only IgA is transferred over the breast milk to provide protection from infection. But we see lots of IgGs going over and the IgGs that are going over into the breast milk have very potent, particular inflammatory profiles. 
And we believe that the IgGs are more likely to be key to early life protection following breast milk um, uh, ingestion than the IgAs actually, um, because we believe these IgGs have higher affinity, interestingly, for SARS-CoV-2 antigens. And so there seems to be some really interesting selection going on at the level of the breast tissue that might again empower babies mucosally with antibodies that have very specific functions that will help infants resist and control the virus more effectively. So there's some really interesting peculiarities of what the breast milk is delivering to infants that it might also give us clues about what types of immune mechanisms might be more relevant for protection in early life um, at mucosal barriers. Yep. Um, awesome. Well, we've got millions more great audience questions. So Alfredo, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, thank you. So, um, my question would be, um, what would be the driver of the increased expression of F FC gamma 3 receptor in the placenta? Excellent question, Alfredo. Okay. Super good question. Okay. So during infection, right, we know we get the cytokine storm. And, um, and probably as you guys have read is that um, women with pregnant women tend to have more severe disease and their age matched women in the general population. What we've begun to know, what notice is that many of these cytokines do regulate FC receptor expression. And so what ends up happening is that for example, FC gamma R1, which is not, doesn't seem to be a big player here, but that one is an interferon inducible gene. And so with the level of interferon, you also see concomitant ex over expression of FC gamma R1, on particular um, immune tissues within the uh, uh, different infected individuals. What we've begun to see now is interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and other cytokines seem to be drivers of FC gamma R3A expression, particularly in the placenta. So we see a very nice correlation between these cytokines and expression of these FC receptors that we believe are critical for selecting particular antibodies out of the blood and into the tissues. So we think that this is an uh, evolutionarily conserved mechanism where during pregnancy, the mom wants to still make sure, even if she's infected, that she's going to give lots of antibodies to her baby, right? She wants to know that even though some of those antibodies might be inflamed and FCRN might not like them all that much, she wants to somehow drive enhanced selection of potentially newly formed antibodies in the mom by using these cytokine inflammatory responses that occur during infection to program the placenta to upregulate particular FC receptors and other types of C-type lectin receptors to still grab really good antibodies from the mom and give them over to the baby. So I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg, Alfredo, of understanding how these cytokine responses that occur during pregnancy shape the type of antibody selection machinery we have within the placenta. So far, we've really only looked at these canonical FC receptors and seen that they definitely are responsive to these cytokine cascades that are associated with infection. And we believe that there probably is a lot more going on. And so hopefully with more interest in placental biology, people will start looking at other types of you know, antibody binding proteins and begin to truly understand and decode how the placenta is making these decisions uh, to transfer antibodies to the neonate. And if I can add one more thing, Alfredo, I think this is a really important point, but you know, this type of barrier selectivity is not only happening in the placenta, right? This type of selectivity is happening across the blood brain barrier. It's also occurring as you move from blood into tissues, there's endothelial regulation of antibody transfer across so many different parts of the body. This is not just happening in the baby. It's just in the baby is where we studied it the most. So whenever you have an infection, whenever you have a vaccination, your antibodies change, but so do your barriers. And your barriers now have to make decisions about what they're gonna permit to enter into those new tissues and organs. And that permission is essentially regulated by the FC receptors or antibody binding receptors that are differentially tuned by cytokines and inflammatory modulators um, uh, that's in the system at that time. Thank you, that, that's really fascinating.
Yeah, it, it, if this were a three-hour talk, I would love to um, get into blood-brain barrier crossing. Um, uh, but uh, Megan, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? For antibodies that might be generated during uh, infection. Can you speak? We, we can't, Megan, we can't hear you very well. Can you um, speak more loudly? Um, is this better? It's better, but it's still pretty quiet. Can you okay, this, shout your question? <laughs> I will shout my question. Um, I was wondering how you're controlling for antibodies that may be generated during co-infection with other pathogens in SARS-CoV-2 positive mothers. Yeah, that's, oh uh, God. So, so we're trying to ignore those co-infections. Um, and and we, we've done it pretty um, effectively. I have to say that we only look at, you know, flu and CoV-2 um, largely, um, you know, Maybe fortunately, because we're all wearing masks, there's not as many other infections going around um, the world right now. Um, and in most of our women that we have seen in the hospital that have been hospitalized where we've been able to do these studies, um, you know, the, the mostly the, most of them are coming in really not with evidence of any other infections based on our biofire analysis. So we're not seeing a ton of co-infections to ask the question of whether or not like a flu specific response or an RSV specific response, or maybe a parvo response might also be affected by this particular phenomenon. So we haven't had that um, opportunity in this particular um, uh, study. Um, and in fact, we see that the flu specific response is still transfer really beautifully, right? Like there's this selective enhanced transfer to babies um, in the SARS-CoV-2 positive moms, but the SARS-CoV-2 responses stay really flat or they go down. Um, so, so I don't think that we can really tackle that question as effectively here, um, but we are starting now with some of the pregnancy cohorts um, where we're seeing pregnancy and maybe other things happening at the same time, um, where we can look to see if there is something different about um, circulating pathogens versus vaccine induced responses that might tell us where, if there's more, um, uh, you know, discrimination of what is able to transfer versus what's not able to transfer. So unfortunately, I can't really address your question because everyone's wearing masks, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, I look forward to seeing the, hearing about the results of the, this new longitudinal component of your research. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Galit. Um, so here's a question about vaccines in pregnant women. So we are in the middle of a vac massive vaccine rollout and vaccinating pregnant women is a topic of active discussion. So in general, uh, I, I believe third trimester seems to be the time when maximum transfer happens. But then now we're seeing that probably there's some wisdom in vaccinating them sooner because the antibodies that are transferred, the quality of antibodies are possibly better. So what do we do? What's your take? Yeah. So, okay. So here's my answer to that. So you know, um, it has been taboo to study vaccine responses in pregnant women, right? That is the fact of the matter. And it, and it has been taboo for, you know, practical and ethical reasons that, you know, vaccine developers are afraid of going into pregnant women because of the potential risk to pregnancy, right? We have seen very limited evidence that vaccines do cause enhanced levels of, you know, pregnancy terminations, but there's always this risk and this worry which is why so little research has been done on truly trying to understand how vaccines prime immune responses differentially at different times along the gestational you know, timeline and where it's optimally, um, it's optimal to drive immunity to basically um, transfer the most effective um, responses over to the infant. What I think is really important to remember, right, Sarada, is almost all of our dogma right now is founded on either looking at transfer of antibodies to vaccines that are administered in infancy mm -hmm. in the pregnant mom, like measles, mumps, rubella, endemic pathogens like Coxsackie viruses, enterovirus, polymyelitis viruses, or to vaccines like flu and pertussis that we have seen previously in our lives. These are all recall responses. So any kind of conclusions we draw on the advantage of vaccinating the third trimester with any of those data streams is incredibly influenced by the fact that these are all pre-existing immune responses that are already floating in our blood system. They're not currently inflamed. And so therefore, whatever we learn from that may not apply to the induction of responses with a de novo antigen to a de novo pathogen that we have never seen before in our lives. Mm. There was some vaccine work that was done during um, the Zika um, pandemic 
where um, folks started looking at antibody transfer there, and they saw very similarly that there was kind of this flat Zika transfer um, towards the third trimester of if moms were infected in the third trimester of pregnancy. So we know that the third trimester, we have the fattest, juiciest placenta that can theoretically transfer more antibody. But I would bet, and this is research that has not been done effectively, is that that placenta is also more restricted and more careful in what it uh, transfers over. And so I think this is a, a unique opportunity in the history of vaccine development, right, in humans, where we can now study with all these new vaccines, new platforms that are coming out, where women are gonna be vaccinated at different times along their gestational uh, timeline, we're gonna be able to, for the first time, begin to actually develop data that tells us that it is truly more efficacious to vaccinate in the first trimester with a de novo uh, vaccine versus in the third trimester, or maybe the second trimester is better. We don't know yet what the answer to that is, right? And so this is where we have to build data to begin to truly make informed decisions and to make informed recommendations of when it is optimal to vaccinate women during pregnancy. If we don't seize that opportunity and do that now, it's gonna be years until we're gonna be in the same situation again. And we're gonna be in the same paralyzed state where we're not gonna know what to recommend to pregnant women, right? And so this is where we have to do this work now and we have to do it in an organized way, right? Where many groups that are interested in placental biology have to get together to really begin to make these um, data happen and come to light. Agreed. That's awesome. Um, Galit, I've got another one. Um, do you mind going back to your slide that shows the flavors of antibodies that are retained in cord versus transferred? Sure. It was, it was so data rich. I've got a lot of questions here. This one? This one? Yes, yes, that one. Oh. So, um, I mean, there's just so much interesting stuff going on here. So like um, uh, CD107A, that's better known to us neuroscience people as LAMP1. That's the thing we use to mark endosome, uh, lysosomes. Um, uh, I you know, quickly Googled and saw that it's involved in NK cell activation as well. Yeah, that's right. It's a marker that the NK cell has released its granular content. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important, it's also lysosomal marker for that reason. Yeah. So, I mean, so do, do, do these, do these um, functions that are, that are being transferred, do, do, does this make sense to you? Is that what you would transfer? Yeah. If you so this is, yeah, so these are the, these are um, the functions that empower the infant with antibodies that can recruit and K cells to kill. Mm. And the reason this is so important, right, is that the first day of life, Babies are born with an immature immune system. Mm -hmm. The only immune cell that babies have that are most mature on the first day of life are NK cells. Whoa. Okay. Their monocytes suck, their neutrophils suck, their complement system sucks, but their NK cells are mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I think this is why the placenta does this, right? It's like picking mm -hmm. these antibodies. It's like, it's like hand selecting antibodies to give to the baby that are gonna essentially recruit these cells that are able to fight pathogens on the first day of life. Wow, that's, that's so awesome. Uh, I just have one more technical question about this. Um, so we see the FCR, the antibodies with FC, the, oh, so wait, is that, what, the FCRN, what is that, what does that the mean? The FC receptor down here. Right, right. I mean, I thought that, I, um, so why is it retained in the mom? Is yeah, that the why is it retained? I mean, what that that's super counterintuitive. Okay, so this is really interesting. This is a really good point. Whoever brought that up is really um, clever. So you have to think. So the so titers in the moms are still higher for many things compared to titers in the babies. And so what what's going to end up happening is that you know that there is still some residual FCRN binding that is present in the babies that uh, or in the moms that is not all anybody transferred over to the baby. Yeah. What this model is doing is it's maximizing to find what is most different across the two groups. And the difference in the actual binding of the neonatal receptor is not the biggest difference. And that's what this bar means. It's important for the model, but what really distinguishes 
the antibodies that are going into the baby or versus going staying in the mom are other features. So there's other qualities of the antibodies that is more important for explaining what the placenta is choosing. And so FCRN, even though we think dogmatically is the most important yeah. molecule for driving this, that is yeah. not what the biology shows. Wow. So that's what's so important about this because you know you can do this for any barrier, right? This is like the point I wanna make with this technology, right? Anyone, anyone can do this. This is like not rocket science. But what we're seeing across all barriers is that it's always other features of the antibodies that are changing in the swarms of antibodies that are present on one side or the other. And that these features here are more important mm -hmm. and they're being selected more aggressively than these features here, even though we would think intuitively that neonatal receptor is important. Mm -hmm. And to reiterate those, um, those glycans, you think that's through FC gamma R3 binding? Yeah, so so you know, so we can't say definitively which one is more important because there are no humans that are either lacking the neonatal receptor or the FC gamma R3. Yeah. Um, there are mice that lack it, but mice unfortunately don't transfer antibodies in the same way that humans do. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that we can say definitively by using monoclonals with different mm -hmm. glycan profiles mm -hmm. is that we can see that the monoclonals bind um, the same modification enhances binding to both of these receptors. So they both seem to have a preference for this particular sugar. And the one coincidental piece of data, right, is just that if you look at, you know, what happens in the placenta during infection, when you get this selective transfer, you just see this massive enhancement of co-localization between these FC receptors during uh, pregnancy. And so it, it just kind of, you know, it forces us to think, right, that there must be some coordination in why you're getting this selectivity and why it's working better, even in the face of these altered glycans and giving babies the antibodies they need to survive. Okay, well, Galit, we, we should let you go. I have another hour's worth of questions, but you've been very generous with your time. <laughs> and um, this is such an important topic. So, um, so timely. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for the invitation and, uh, and send me any more questions if you have them. I'm easy to find. Um, okay. 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 Thanks guys. Bye. 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 Um, everyone next week, um, Matt, oh, there we go. Uh, Ravi Gupta next week. Um, yeah. Uh, chronic infections, so long COVID. Um, all right, we'll see you there next week. Be safe.